All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of The Way It Is. And I'm your host, as always, Luca Andalfato with Team Luca First at Remax Service First Realty here in Kingston. And I have to say that uh, we've achieved the pinnacle of our podcasting for this podcast because I'm delighted and thrilled to have none other than Steve Pakin, the, uh, the host of TVO's uh, The Agenda. And uh, Steve, I've got your bio here, and it would take up probably eighty percent of the podcast just reading. Yeah, so it let's off, not bother. But, just so, <laughs> but you are a prolific author. You've done documentaries. You've got numerous doctorate degrees, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, amazing! Thank you for being here. It's ha- I'm very happy to be with you, Luca. And Kingston has a special place in my heart these days because not only does one of my best pals live there, but my daughter goes to university there. Well, there you go. We did. We, and you know what? In th- my 35 years of doing this, there's always connections back to this, uh, back to Kingston through the university and, and even through the forces and all of that. So that's great that you have that, that connection with us. So, you know, uh, before we get to, into the sort of the heavy duty political stuff, I see here you're a Leafs fan. So I guess with tomorrow night being the first night of the playoffs, Steve, I've got to say, are you a little bit trepidatious or what's what, what's your take? Actually not. No, no. I'm a great believer in fate. And, uh, you know, the Leafs have been fated not to win for 17 straight years. They have the longest uh, humiliation streak going of eight playoff losses in a row, I believe. Uh, that's the worst of any team in the NHL. And if they are fated to win a series this year, they will. So I'm very at peace with the whole thing. <laughs> okay, well, good for you. You're certainly more zen about it than a lot of other fans that I know. I think that's, that's right, sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to where this all began for you. How, what, I mean, journalism, this whole metamorphosis into your career, what, was there a light bulb moment for you as a young man or what, what was the impetus to, to get into what you're doing now? Funnily enough, th- th- there was exactly that kind of a moment. There was a light bulb moment. There was a eureka moment. It was 1978. It was my first year as a freshman student at the University of Toronto. Even before any of the classes had started, there was something, it was clubs night at Hart House. You know, Hart House is this old yep. Gothic building on the downtown campus of the U of T. And I walked in the front door and there's the table for the geography club and the archery club and the chess club and the debate club. And, and then there was a table that said U of T radio. And Luca, that was the moment. That was a eureka moment. It's something I really hadn't thought about before. But I walked over to that table and I spoke to the guy behind the table. And I said, do you have anybody who does the play-by-play for the Varsity Blues hockey or football teams? He said, no. And I said, could I do it? And he said, yep. And that was it. That's how it started. And just green like that, but obviously you had a propensity for it. I mean, you, you just had well, to it or? I was interested in it. I can't say I was any good at it. In fact, I can say, because I taped a lot of the stuff I did back then, I can categorically say I was horrible. But I can also <laughs> say that I had a lot of enthusiasm and that, and that it was that moment that really made me think, I think I now know what I want to do with my life. And uh, I was the play-by-play guy. Michael Landsberg is a name that may be known wow. to many people. Yep listening or watching to this he you know did uh, off the record on tsn for i don't know 25 years something like that yeah and he was he was my color commentator and the two of us started a great friendship together we actually worked together and uh, professionally after our days at u of t were done and uh, that's how it all started wow well that's that's amazing and uh, and then of course you got into tvo i guess or was that something that you well saw that was well down the line or- yeah, that, that was, came that yeah. came much later. I, I, having figured out that that's what I wanted to do with my life, uh, I then went to get a master's degree in broadcast journalism. After that, and then I got a my first job was a city hall reporter, uh, Toronto City Hall, for CHFI and what was then called CFTR. Then yep. seven years at CBC, and then TVO, where I've been for the last thirty. Right. And you uh, uh, you were born in Hamilton. Do you still reside in Hamilton or are you somewhere else? No, in the I have GTA? not lived in Hamilton since I moved to U of T, but I'm back oh. every weekend. My parents live in Hamilton. Uh, my brother's in Burlington, so I'm back every, I, I, I go in every Sunday to go visit my folks. Oh, good, good. And of course, good. there's Ticat games, which bring me back as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So I've, I've watched TVO. I can't say I've watched every episode. I'd be lying if I said I did, but I, I, I usually, in the winter You'd have a very that... unbalanced life if you said you'd watched every show, so <laughs> well, that would concern me. <laughs> okay, well, good. I'm glad you said that. But um, it's usually, 
always so civil, the discourse there and everything. So, because, you know, uh, I, I was thinking to myself, there has to be some a memorable highlight and maybe a memorable highlight in not such a positive, you know, that wasn't so positive. Has there ever been an episode, because everybody seems so civil and the discourse is so civil, has there ever been an episode where things got heated or fiery or? Well, ever, yes. But I can probably count the numbers of episodes on the fingers of one hand. Uh, our brand, if you like, or our promise to our viewers and listeners, because we're on podcast, of, of course, as well. So our promise to people is that this is the place to come if you want to have a thoughtful, intelligent, serious, um, hopefully not boring, but but civilized conversation about the big issues at the dawn of the 21st century. Uh, if you're looking for the food fight, if you're looking for chairs being thrown, you know, go watch another show. Uh, our hope is that we can get people with very different points of view to sit around a table, virtual or literal, and have a civilized conversation about things. And I'm, I'm, I am frequently told, particularly by guests in the United States that we have on the show, who, who say, boy, I tell you what, we could never have that kind of conversation on American television. You, you got to be, you know, you got to be fighting with somebody or you got to be insulting somebody. And that's just not what we do. Now, I can't say it's never happened, um, but very, very rarely, because that's not, we don't want that. You know, everybody yeah. else is doing that. We're going to be something different. And and you're, uh, I guess, uh, self-admittedly a political junkie, if you will. In fact, I saw the episode last week with, is it Daniel Rohr, the Academy Award winner, yes. the documentary? That yep. was a great episode. By, that was a great interview, by the way. I, I Can you really imagine that? that? He's 29 years old. He's won the Academy Award for documentary filmmaking. Amazing. It's, it's unbelievable. Un yep. And just, just out of a thought, right? And then... Yeah, well, it, that's it, how it starts. It starts with an idea. <laughs> it's crazy. But... Given what you just said in terms of how you operate the show and the and the context uh, that it operates in, what what's your take on the state of affairs and politics these days with these this ever the needle always going towards the populist sort of platforms? You know, I mean, I'm not here to disparage anybody, but I mean, you see Polyev doing it. I, our our premier here in Ontario has been guilty of it from time to time. What's your sense of that, I guess? Well, my concern is that is that the Ontario that I grew up in was a very moderate, pragmatic place where most of the voters were in the middle. And what it meant was that you didn't have to you didn't have to cross a, a, a huge bridge in order to find some common ground with uh, somebody that you needed to make a deal with in politics. My concern about politics today is that it's getting, you know, the middle is disappearing and people are moving to the extremes. They're moving to their corners. Now, it's way worse in the United States, to be sure. Uh, it, politics has become so polarized in the United States, it, you know, it beggars the mind to see how people agree on anything nowadays. They do, but it's it's not like it was 25 or 50 years ago. And I'm I'm increasingly concerned about the possibilities of all of that happening uh, in Canada, I would I would prefer it didn't happen. Um, not that I get a choice in the matter, or I guess I do to the extent that I have a vote. But but you know my my preference, and I think society seems to work best when you know when people are center right or center left, and they get elected. The people in their wisdom send them to Queens Park or send them to Parliament Hill or to their various city councils, and then you know thoughtful, pragmatic relatively moderate people uh, come together and make decisions and try and make society better. And nobody comes away feeling they got everything that they wanted, but they come away feeling they had some input into society progressing. Uh, yeah, that's harder to do nowadays. And, yeah. you know, if we're all going to retreat to our respective corners, it's going to be increasingly hard to do. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we get something else. So I would argue, though, that that sentiment always existed and it was not to throw it all at donald trump's feet but he certainly gave it a voice again right i mean i my analogy or metaphor is that he took a big stick and stirred the muddy bottom that everything had sort of settled down into the sediment and stirred it back up and then that created and then of course the pandemic simply just exacerbated all of that right i mean what, what are your thoughts on that i think there's a lot of truth in what you said but i don't think we can blame it all on on mr trump I think the reality is he he certainly exploited sentiments that were there to be exploited. 
and and the Democratic Party in the states has to take its share of the blame for the fact that there were just millions and millions of Americans who felt that that party had abandoned them. And, you know, when you feel abandoned, you will go to somebody who says, I am your voice. And that's what Mr. Mm -hmm. Trump said. Now, you know, in the judgment of many, he's a false prophet. In the judgment of many, his behavior has been as appalling as it gets and, and uh, you know, bordering on corruption and various things. Um, and, you know, smarter people than me can make their own minds up about how that is. But, but of course, the difficulty with it all gets back to the point I just made, which is that the Republican Party is now so far to the populist right and a lot of the Democratic Party is very far to the populist left. And the people, you know, the sort of conservative Democrats or liberal Republicans, of whom there used to be some, and who could congregate more in the middle and could get things done, uh, they are, I mean, I don't know that they even exist anymore. Hmm. And the problem is, if you've got, if you want to reach across an aisle to get something done with somebody, and that person is 100 miles away from you, uh, what can you get done? Uh, precious yeah. little. I also think, though, that, Paul, I mean, and you have the most, well, certainly way more experience than I do, but a lot of experience because you, you, you grew up in that world or sort of covered that world. But I think even the politicians themselves, the, the, the mandates have changed. I find it's very self-serving a lot of the times. And, and we saw a lot of that during the pandemic, at least for me it seemed like it was just lip service, lip service to headlines, lip service to thing in order to placate, you know, whatever voting demographic you were going to try to do at that time. Uh, and it's all reactionary. There's really no thought going into uh, policy or anything like that. I, I'm not so sure about that, Luca. I mean, I really want to, let's put it this way. I've met thousands of politicians in my life. I've met thousands of people who've been elected, and I've met thousands of people who've tried to be elected and who were unsuccessful in getting elected. And I think we have to remember that probably 85 to 90 percent of the people who stand for office lose, and mm. most of them know they're going to lose, but they do it anyway. <laughs> Why do they do it? They do it because they think they've got something to offer. They think they've got something to say. They think they've got a contribution that they want to make to society. And and I don't disparage um anybody who's got the guts to put their name on a ballot i you know i'm never going to do it i don't know if you have done it or would do it but you know it's 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 not a, it's not the way i want to make a living so i don't disparage anybody who wants to do it having said that i think we have to make darn sure that we keep politics as civil as possible i mean to be sure uh it's supposed to be tough you know vigorous debates uh, differences of opinion. I mean, this is democracy. We're not all supposed to think the same way. Yeah. But you'd yeah. like to believe that that you know good people can come together and find some common good at the end of the day that moves society forward. Yeah. No. Uh, well, good point. Good point. Um, we can't not talk about the pandemic, obviously, because that's I think created changed the world we live in. I think irreparably, or how forever and ever. Um, you know, I, I when you were doing the show, you were up in some part of your home, I'm guessing. Or I was in the was. attic. That's exactly right. <laughs> that was good. It looked yeah. like, the, yeah. uh, uh, well appointed, by the way. <laughs> it was it was a nice little home studio, that's for sure. Um, but coming out of the pandemic now, what I mean, we saw the challenges during the pandemic. We're seeing the fallout now. What are the? I guess if you had to pick three issues that are people are grappling with right now what, what would they be in, in in your radar well you know my world is the province of ontario that's that's very much what we cover so you know when you're talking provincial policy you're always talking healthcare. you're always talking education and as part of healthcare, now we can say you're often talking mental health as well so let's start with that and i know today the ontario government's made another announcement as it relates to trying to get people uh, better educated coming out of the pandemic um i I got four kids, but three of them had left home before the pandemic hit. I still had one at home uh, when the pandemic hit. And I know for a fact, <clears throat> I can say for a fact that that kid did not get a great education when the mm -hmm. pandemic was on. I mean, let's face it. There's just no substitute for a, a teacher in a classroom with 25 kids in it. And, you know, the dynamic that happens in that setting, uh, you know, like my daughter, I think she did the best she could. 
under adverse circumstances, opening up her laptop, sitting alone in her bedroom, doing her schoolwork that way. But let's face it, that's not what anybody has in mind for education. So there's a lot of catch up, a lot of learning loss and a lot of catch up there. Uh, as it relates to healthcare, I mean, how many people couldn't go see their doctors during the pandemic because uh, doctors, uh, GPs had to shut their offices? Uh, you know, when we were locked down, it was pretty intense and hospitals were, were you know, very frightening places for, for many people, particularly for the people who work there. So we're still trying to make a comeback from that. And I note from the, uh, who was it, the uh, financial accountability officer's report of a few months ago, I note that we are still uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of surgical procedures and mm -hmm. tests behind, right, that people had to postpone because of the pandemic. And we're still catching up to that. Uh, and it might be it might be two or three years before we catch up to to that kind of backlog. And 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 how much did people's health deteriorate because they couldn't get those surgeries or they couldn't get those tests? So I'm very worried about that as well. And then, of course, uh, as it relates to mental health, I mean, we did a show the other day, Luca, that I thought was um, really unusual in as much as there was a, a, there's a new study out. It's an international study done by researchers here in Canada that showed that people were a lot more resilient as it related to their mental health than we might have initially thought. Now, it's 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 a it's a first look at this, right? It's a first pass at right. this kind of information. So they've got a lot more research to do. But if that's true, oh my goodness, wouldn't that be great? But all the experts I've talked to on that show and since that show say that it's a very mixed picture. Yes, there was a lot of resilience from some people who have been able to come back, but there's a lot of people who got left behind and we can't allow that to stand either. Yeah, I think I saw part of that because you had the, there was an author and it focused on teens as well, right? Or, or adolescents, yeah. right? Yeah, I did yeah. watch, I caught a snippet of that. Um, well, and, and then going back to the, just the healthcare in general, I mean, in Kingston, we had uh, a group of six doctors announce their retirement but they've been GP for 40 plus years. I mean, I, I, I knew them as kid, you know, when I was a kid, in fact, you know, and so you can't fault them for wanting to <laughs> enjoy some form of retirement now mm -hmm. after all those years of service. But now that eliminates that's, all of a sudden 8,000 people that don't have a, a family doctor. We don't anymore. have a family doctor. That's right. We've got a million, a million five, 1.5 million people in the province of Ontario who don't have a family doctor. And the family doctor is the gatekeeper to the whole healthcare system. Uh, that's that, I mean that is job one right now in healthcare. We got to get family docs out there so that people have access, and and nurses that want to stay in the field too, or mm -hmm. at least have ones that come. Yeah, I mean, I, if you stop to really think about it, yeah, you, you get it, it makes you sad. <laughs> There's no question about it. That's for sure. What um, politically now, um, you know, Doug Ford's got his new mandate. Yep. Um, what are you seeing in your area vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, I obviously I do real estate. That's what I, I, I focus on. So I, I see the housing needs. Um, you know, homelessness is a massive, massive problem. Do you see a light at the, I mean, not that there's going to be a fix or a, an instant fix or anything, but do you see any optimism or, or hope for, for that? In, in in your world and in your area because obviously uh, as toronto the you know the center of the universe for the province obviously has the largest it's just volume right there's more more people affected so yeah i i um i live at the right near the corner of young and eglinton in toronto and i work at the corner of young and eglinton in toronto <laughs> so a lot of my first-hand daily knowledge uh, it comes from this part of the province this part of the city which is booming there are 500 million dollar condominium projects going up all over the place in fact somebody told me the other day there are more cranes in the skies at young and eglinton than there are in the entire city of boston i think jennifer keysmat the former chief planner for toronto i think i heard her oh. say that in a podcast so on the one hand this city i mean it, if if any of your listeners or viewers come to Toronto, they will see real estate is going gangbusters. I mean, there's right. just new stuff going up all the time. And that's good because, frankly, there's 120,000 people who move to Toronto every year and they need places to live. And this city has to be a lot more creative in how it finds places for them to live. I mean, uh, Luca, I don't know how it is in Kingston, but I know in Toronto, there are some places that are right on subway lines 
there are some neighborhoods right on subway lines which are operating under 1940s bylaws that don't allow anything but bungalows. I mean, that's wow. insane in this day yeah. and age. Like, I'm sorry for the people who live in those neighborhoods. I know they'd like everything left exactly the way it is, but but that's just not reasonable in this day and age in yeah. in the biggest city in the country with the city of, you know, the city of Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie moving here every year. Mm -hmm. So that's got to, that, I mean, they've got to change that. Uh, something's got to give on that. Um, I can also tell you, apropos of what we were just talking about, I'm on the subway most days, and it there is definitely a fear and concern on the subway, the likes of which I have not seen since moving to Toronto here in, in 1978. There's a lot more mental illness that you see on the subways. Mm -hmm. There are a lot more homeless people on the subways. There are more people begging on the subways. And, you know, I'm I'm not a policy expert in any of this stuff. I'm just a guy who asks questions on a TV show. But I don't know if it's all pandemic, but you got to assume the pandemic played a large part in all of this. And and we've got to get to the bottom of it because it's just not it's just not good and i'm sure every city in the province of ontario can say the same thing they're seeing more yeah. mental health and more of homelessness than they've ever seen before a hundred percent kingston's not yeah. uh, not unaffected by it and uh i will i will give uh props to kingston though and its council uh, and the municipality because it's gotten uh it's taken a very progressive uh, approach to the zoning and and the official plan now has changed where people can create additional suites on their property assuming it meets you know certain physical requirements and everything like that so they understand the need for uh for more housing whatever that looks like vis-a-vis -vis apartments and and, and everything else and uh but we, we are definitely seeing more more uh, homeless and, and mental health issues and and whatnot it's and tragic I mean, it's it's super tragic and 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 like you uh, you know you and i've watched certain programs and you talk to certain experts it's just such a people say it's such a complex issue and yet you just wonder is it just the money like because even if you had a bag full, like a planet full of money to throw at it you still don't have the people or the personnel or the infrastructure. And I mean, to get all that is just like, that's the other, uh, there's the rub, right? How do you, you know, you want to build uh, 1.5 million homes by 2025. Well, how about building some shelters? How about building some and having the people that'll staff them? And because that's what you need. You need these people taken care of when they're in these facilities, right? They're, you've nailed it. I mean, that you, you in, in 30 seconds, you've nailed what the problem is, which is it's partly that we have more of this going on than ever before. It's partly that workers and supplies and interest rates are all problematic these days, uh, making it more difficult to create new supply. And, uh, you know, it's a, you don't like the expression of perfect storm because there's nothing perfect about it, but it's all these bad things coming together at, at the same time to make it more difficult. Now, I know we've done shows on the fact that other places in the world, and I can think of, I guess, uh, you know, Denmark is an example, Finland's an example, where they've, t they, they, they've cut homelessness by 80%, and they've done it simply by building homes. They've gotten homeless people off the street by building homes. And I'll tell you, I, I heard a stat the other day, St. Michael's Hospital is one of the big hospitals in downtown Toronto, and the neighborhood that it's in means that it caters to a lot of people who are in trouble. Homeless people, people with mental health and addiction issues, uh, very low-income people. So their catchment area is difficult, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And I think I heard a hospital administrator the other day say that there are literally 300 homeless and or addicted people for whom St. Michael's Hospital has to expend probably 20% of their emergency department budget because there's just a steady merry-go-round of people, of that small cohort of people coming in all the time needing their services. And of course, the hospital, unlike a private hospital in the United States, they're not going to turn them away. But just think of it. If you could find places for those folks to live with some wraparound services that would check in on them and make sure they were okay, think about how much less taxed our emergency departments would be Think about how many more services we have available to treat other things that may be, you know, more urgent and more easily solvable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, finding homes for homeless people or people dealing with addictions or mental health issues. If you solve that issue, there are so many other issues that get solved at the same time. So we just got to do it. 
And and I, I dare say that it probably provides some form of economic boon or or unquestionably you know, right. I mean, you 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 when you make someone productive or at least you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if if you think on it too long, you, 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 it hurts your head. There's no question it does. about it. For sure. It does, yeah, <laughs> and, and it does. Look, I I know it's 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 always very easy to just sort of uh, take a poke at somebody, you know, take a poke at a politician, a minister of this, or a you know whatever, a deputy minister of that. I, that's an easy shot. Uh, and these are complicated problems, and you know they didn't they didn't become problems overnight. And they're not going to get solved overnight. But but my goodness, we've we've got to start taking some pretty big steps here or we're in trouble. Right. And, and, but you, you know, you just, you know, cast a light on exactly that. These, these have been problems that started years and decades ago. 40 right? years but, ago, for sure. 50 years ago. Right. But just left unattended or wasn't on the radar or yeah. And, and it, it, I guess it, it makes you feel sad that you had those opportunities to do something at that time, I mean, or at least think about it, and no one was progressive enough, I guess, to to really think that these these were well, going to be issues or or had the forethought. Maybe I don't know, and maybe that's expecting too much. I guess. I, well, I, I I think ironically, it was an attempt to do something progressive that that started a lot of the difficulty in the first place. And I take you back to the 1970s, where I know many experts believed that the best thing to do for people suffering from mental health issues was to deinstitutionalize them and take them out of these, you know, what were pretty awful places to live back then, these psychiatric yeah. hospitals, and get them into the community with the, with the feeling being that if they could potentially live in more normal circumstances, their mental health would improve. Except the problem is they didn't create any services in the community or not enough services in the community. So where do they live? They live in the streets. And, yeah. you know, it, it, it was a well-intentioned policy that wasn't well thought through and not adequately funded and not adequately serviced. And here we are 50 years later, and there are too many people paying the price for those bad decisions. Right. And, and I mean, even uh, the issue with... Um, um, you know the the all of the during the pandemic with uh, the partner same uh, partner violence and and all that kind of thing and yes. you know there's there's not enough shelters for for women uh, for any partner that's been abused or suffered through you know um, I appreciate your have. attempt to be to be gender neutral on this when you said any partner <laughs> but the reality is this is something that you know ninety yeah. percent of ninety percent of the problem is is men being violent to women and you're right there's a shortage of shelters and so on there's there's i mean there's no end to the need that that you and i and everybody else sees out there and i know there are a lot of people trying their best i've been to uh, you know i've done the interviews i've been to the conferences i've talked to lots of people whose jobs it is to solve these problems and i'm sure there are i know there are a lot of well-intentioned good-hearted people out there who are trying to do it and we have to encourage them and but we've just yeah. we've got to do more yeah, I agree. Uh, listen, the time's already going by, and I, I don't want to keep you longer than I need to. So, maybe a way to end it is uh, well. First off, I got to touch on when we before we came live, your Italian is impeccable. So, where uh, where did you learn your Italian? <laughs> Have you traveled to Italy? Or I, I've been to Italy a few times, but let's let's face it, I'm faking it here, Luca. Now, <laughs> I can say I when I went to Italy when I was 17 years old. That was my first trip to Italy, a high school trip to Italy. And I memorized a half a dozen expressions in my Berlitz handbook that I read on the train between cities. And I got those expressions down pretty well. So I can say, Luca, io sono molto lieto di fare la su conoscenza questa mattina. Con questa pomeriggio. We're in the afternoon here. So <laughs> yeah. I can say that. But I'm very happy to make your acquaintance. And I can yeah. probably say a half a dozen other things really well. But the fact is, I don't speak Italian. I just, I do a pretty good job memorizing and faking. Well, you have you have a great your accent and the, the, your uh, phonetics are are impeccable. So I well, I have another I have so. another I have another secret weapon here. My wife's born in Rome. Well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that helps for sure. Yeah. Do your kids are they speaking any Italian or picking any? Yeah, uh, you know what? Them? Big mistake. Big mistake. Didn't speak Italian to the to the kids, and um, although some of them picked it up, it's interesting, you know. And we have a niece as well who at the age of, I think, about 28, speaking no Italian at all, moved to Rome, got a job in Rome, and is perfectly bilingual now. So, it, you know, it can be done. 
Rick Ann. Well, listen, Steve, this has been an absolute delight and a pleasure. And now when I see you on TVO, I'll have a, a, a an extra a smile on my face because I said, I know that guy and I, I had a <laughs> great opportunity to talk to him. So I wish you all the best and uh, I wish us all the best going forward in this province. And uh, yeah, we'll see how what the future holds for us. But thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Luca, grazie mille. Ci vediamo alla prossima volta. <laughs> ciao. Alla, 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 ciao, ciao.